Well, good morning. What few of you? What few of you there are? <laughs> I appreciate you coming, First Lutheran Church, Texarkana. Uh, I know everybody here knows who I am, but I guess Matt sent it out on the internet. Uh, I'm Jimmy Curtis, I'm the chairman of the Board of Elders, and I'll be conducting service while pastors enjoying himself on the beach somewhere. Um, <laughs> Well deserved, I agree. Uh, before we get started, this is this is Trinity Sunday, and I I want to tell a little history about Trinity Sunday. And it is the first Sunday after Pentecost to honor the Holy Trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Although the word Trinity does not appear in Scripture, it is taught in Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20, and 2 Corinthians 13, uh, verse 14 concept of the Trinity has never been completely understood or rationalized, but it is clearly taught in Scripture. Understand, understanding of all scriptural doctrine is by faith, which comes through the work of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, it is appropriate that this mystery is celebrated the first Sunday after Pentecost, when the outpouring of the Holy Spirit first occurred. On Trinity Sunday, the Christian church ponders with joy and thanksgiving what the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have done to accomplish the salvation of sinful humanity. It is brought to remembrance how Christians should respond to the love God has shown us, praising Him and giving Him glory. We remember the Father as the Creator, the Son as the Savior, and the Holy Spirit as the Comfort. And with that, we will begin with our opening song. Son of Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, forgive us. 
God in His mercy has given His Son to die for you and for His sake forgives you all your sins. Amen. To we'll continue with our responsive reading from Psalm 29. Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders, the Lord over many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is majesty. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon to sing like a cat, and sing among the Lord. The voice of the Lord flashes forth flames of fire. The voice of the Lord The voice of the Lord makes the deer give birth and strips the forest bare, and in the temple all cry, Glory. The Lord sits in the throne of the blood. The Lord sits in the throne of the forever. May the Lord give strength to the people. May the Lord bless his people with peace. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was Continue with the prayer of the day. Almighty and everlasting God, you have given us grace to acknowledge the glory of the eternal uh, Trinity by the confession of the true faith and to worship the unity and the power of the divine majesty. Keep us steadfast in his faith and defend us from all adversaries. For you, O Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, live and reign, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated as we continue with the first reading. Our first reading comes from... From Isaiah 6, verses 1 through 8. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he, he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am, send me. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle reading comes from Acts chapter 2, uh, verses 14b, 22 through 36. Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst. As you yourself know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. You crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he sat at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness and with your presence. Brothers, I may say to you with, the, with confidence about the patriarch David 
that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about his, the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we, will, we, are, we all are witnesses. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you, you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to me, to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand for the gospel. The gospel for today is recorded in John 3, verses 1 through 17. Glory to you, o Lord. The, John teaches Nicodemus. Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they are old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised to be saved. You must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the spirit. How can that be? Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's leader, said Jesus. And do you not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know, and we testify to what we have seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his, only, his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemnation the world, but save the world through him. Here it the gospel for the day. Uh, I don't, you may be seated. I don't have a children's message. I wasn't expecting a lot of children, so we'll continue with our song of the day. <laughs>
Vicki, I apologize. At 1030 last night, I changed the title of my sermon. So, uh, Matt wouldn't accommodate me. So anyway, the wrong title is there, but the new title is Nicodemus Wears a White Hat. And I thought that maybe fit me and a few others a little bit better. So who wears white hats? In the old silent movie days, you always knew who the good guys were. They wore white hats. The bad cowboys always wore black hats. That way, you always knew who the good cowboys were. Well, on October 12, 1940, newspapers reported that Tom Mix, and I'm sure a lot of you remember who Tom Mix is, some of you younger ones won't. <laughs> the movie cowboy who had starred in 370 films had been killed while driving to Phoenix, Arizona. He was behind the wheel of his custom-built roadster with, as you guessed it, a set of longhorns mounted on the radiator. <laughs> he was almost flying when he came over a hill and saw a road crew directly in front of him. Mix literally stood up on the brakes so he might avoid killing the crew, which was working on the broken bridge. His car swung into a gully where his heavy aluminum suitcase flew far and hit him in the back of the head and it broke his neck. Mix got out of his car, walked a few steps, and fell over dead. Amazingly, the newspapers who reported the story also felt it their duty to add, and I quote, Mix was wearing his trademark 10-gallon white Stetson hat. Now why did they bother to report that? Of course Mix was wearing a white hat. He was a movie cowboy, and he was one of the good guys. Everybody knows movie cowboys live by certain rules. A man's got to have a code, a creed to live by no matter his job. John Wayne. A few others. Never steal another man's horse. A horse thief pays with his life. Defend yourself whenever necessary, but always be honest. Remove your guns before sitting at the table. No matter how weary and hungry you are after a long day in the saddle, always tend to your horse's needs before your own. Cuss all you want, but only around men and horses. <laughs> and never order anything weaker than whiskey. Just a few rules to live by. Nicodemus was a white hat guy. He was an incredibly good man. He was honest to the core. He was also a Pharisee. Pharisees made it their stock and trade to keep the rules and be very, very good. Now understand, I'm not talking about just keeping the Ten Commandments. No, the Pharisees didn't hardly worry about them. Over the years, they also added another 633 rules. The Pharisees were serious about their goodness. Nicodemus was doing his level best to be the best white hat Pharisee. He was depending on his goodness his Jewish genetics to earn God's favor. He was doing a pretty good job. Good enough to be a card-carrying member of the Jewish ruling council. He was once one of the 70 special elders of the Jewish nation. Furthermore, he was a teacher of Israel. He had the credentials to interpret and teach others what the Holy Scriptures were saying. He was a number one good guy. If anyone was qualified to wear a white hat, it had to be Nicodemus. John was a theological, last week, and noted that John was a theological message about replacing Jewish rules with himself, his life and message. That's why John began his gospel with the miracle of changing water into wine at the wedding of Cana. John follows that miracle with the conversation Nick, with this conversation Nicodemus had with Jesus. It's about Nicodemus trusting in his white hat. At the wedding of Cana, when the family ran out of wine, Jesus took Jewish jars of water that were meant for the right purification and filled them with wine. The pure water, now turned to new wine, made them utterly worthless for the Jewish rite of purification. Jesus becomes a replacement for all things the Jewish religion was using in order to have God accept their goodness. They wanted the rules to keep, 
It allowed them to judge themselves better than others. They believed that their own goodness would open the doors to heaven. Nicodemus came to Jesus at night because he wasn't sure his white hat rules were enough. Nicodemus had been taught all his life that his Jewish blood, his special connection to Abraham, was enough to earn God's blessings, favor, and entrance into heaven. He came at night because he did not want others to know his anxiety, his insecurity. He was thinking that his white hat had become a tarnished dull gray or solid black. Nicodemus knew his broken rules could not be forgotten, and in his heart he felt like Martin Luther, who centuries later wrote these words. Death brooded darkly over me. Sin was my torment night and day. Left naught but death to be my share, the pangs of hell I suffered. This is basically the conversation. Good teacher, rabbi, we know you're a teacher who has come from God. I have kept all the rules and forms and rituals of our faith. Jesus interrupts and turns to Nicodemus. You must be born again. Well, what does that really mean? Nicodemus, can I start life over as a baby? Jesus, what I'm talking about is that you cannot rely on your family history, your goodness, your Jewishness to open the doors to heaven. I'm the replacement. In the future, heaven's doors are opened by the Spirit giving faith in me as the Savior. You must be born again. What born again means is literally to begin all over again. To be given a second birth, a second chance. The man who was born again doesn't all of a sudden get turned into a super Christian. To be born again is to hear afresh into the process of spiritual growth. It is to wipe the slate of one's past clean. It is to cancel your old mortgage and start again. As the conversation comes to conclusion, Jesus states what might be the most important verse in the New Testament. Just as Moses lifted up the stake in the desert, and all who looked at it were healed from the deadly poisonous bites that brought death, so also when I, the Son of Man, is lifted up on a cross, anyone who believes in me will have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes is not condemned. In some ways, verse 17 suffers from understandable neglect, coming as it does on the heels of what Martin Luther called the heart of the Bible and the gospel in the miniature. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son so that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Many people still miss the Savior's point. People get so wrapped up in the words, being born again, that they get confused, as did Nicodemus. Unfortunately, many people today have the same mindset as Nicodemus. We think our hats are white, not a dull gray, certainly not black. People think without any outside assistance, if we are good enough, God will say, wow, you really do deserve to wear a white hat. You really are a good person. I am so ever overwhelmed by the way you've lived your life, I'm going to invite you into heaven. Nicodemus really believed that heaven was his birthright because he was a descendant of Abraham and he was keeping all the Jewish rules. Jesus is replacing that false theology. You might be thinking, I don't know anyone who believes that their goodness is enough to open heaven's doors. Yeah, you do. Almost every religion in the world says you have to do this or that to work your way up to God. Look at the Hindu who pierces his flesh to show his God he, he is saddened by the wrongs he has done. Observe the faithful follower of Islam who is commanded to obey the five pillars of faith if he hopes to accept, be accepted by Allah. No guarantee, just hope. 
Go to the temples of the world and watch the sacrifices and offerings being made by pilgrims who are trying to earn their God's approval. All of them are trying to earn their white hat. Americans have fallen into the same trap. Many believe that our Judeo-Christian work ethic, our doing good deeds, will outweigh our faults, failures, and broken commandments. I will call it our American theology. Go to any funeral and the eulogy will list all the good things that the individual did. But we Americans have discovered that this view does not really bring peace to our soul. So our new American theology is simple. All religions are simply different pathways to heaven. When Chuck Colson received the 1993 Templeton Prize for Progress in Religion, he spoke to an audience at the University of Chicago on the enduring revolution. In describing the plight of modern society, he mentions four myths that define our time. The four horsemen of the present apocalypse. The first myth is the goodness of man. The myth deludes people into thinking that they are always victims, never villains, always deprived, never depraved. Our new American theology dismisses our responsibility to God as the teaching of a darker age. It can excuse any crime, but it can always blame something or someone else, a sickness of our society or a sickness of the mind. We're all sinners, desperately in need of God's grace. We're all in the same boat, and the boat is sinking. If God doesn't do something, the whole human race will go down to destruction. Jesus said, the Son of Man, come to seek and to save the lost by Jacob's well. He came seeking fishermen, politicians, physicians, tax collectors, rich men at the top of the heap, and the lepers no one else would touch. He sought the prostitutes and drunkards, and they loved him for it. When he was dying, he came seeking one hanging on a cross beside him. There is only one way to heaven. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That verse is not popular with many people because it sounds too narrow in these politically correct times. American theology would be more comfortable if Jesus said, I am the way, but not the way. Every major world religion has had a teacher who prescribed codes of behavior that if kept, Will allow one into the ultimate paradise beyond death. Even the New Age religions that blend Hinduism, Buddhism, and Christianity will tell you that Jesus was a man whose lifestyle should be copied. The difference is that Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus did not say, I am one way among many. No, only those who look to the cross the Savior with the crown of thorns will be given eternal life. It sounds so intolerant to our American ears. Well, it is quite simple. The bones of the teachers of all other world religions are still in the ground. Jesus is different. He rose from, from death with a physical and glorified body. Jesus is the exclusive Savior. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes into the Creator's holy presence without clinging to the nail-pierced hands of Jesus. Amen. We stand as we continue with our affirmation of faith. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and all things visible and invisible. Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of His Father before all the world, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten and not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man. Was crucified also for us in the conscious body. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended to heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with the glory of the judgment.
dead, and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated as we collect our offerings. <coughs>
say, and I think Matt has a tribute he would like to play when I am finished. <clears throat> when I get through, I would ask you to stand for the presentation. Everybody should know that Memorial Day was originally known as Decoration Day, and it originated in years after the Civil War. It was called Decoration Day because the first commemoration of Decoration Day, Memorial Day, whichever you want to call it, was actually uh, organized by a group of slaves that were just set free. And they were decorating the Union soldiers' graves, thanking them for getting them free. And that was somewhere around 1865. In May of 1868, General John Logan, who was a leader of an organization for Northern Civil Way, Veterans call for a nationwide day of remembrance. May the 30th is the chosen day. Many northern states held these events, but as you can guess, the southern states didn't join in until after World War I. In 1968 is when Congress passed the Uniformity Monday Holiday Act, which established Memorial Day as the last Monday in May. This change didn't take effect until 1971, and that same law declared it as a federal holiday. This day is meant to remember the fallen soldiers, not the living. The flag is to be lowered at half mass at sunrise on Memorial Day, and raised back to full mass at noon, and a moment of prayer is to be held at 3 p.m. tomorrow. Matt. You will stand for a fast presentation. Cover on a lighter note our announcements. <coughs> As you've all figured out, Pastor Sumby's on vacation this week, but he will be back uh, next Sunday to take over for me, which I appreciate very much. <laughs> LWML will meet this Tuesday at 5:30 in the Fellowship Hall. Uh, we will be honoring our graduates next Sunday, uh, Matthew uh, and Chase. Oh, we hit the yeah. If I could read, I'm not used to having the screen in the back. Uh, we will have a special voters meeting next week. Be very quick. Uh, Sean Perry was is unfortunately not able to go with Pastor to be our delegate, so it would be a really quick to vote in somebody else. Uh, I don't know that Pastor has anybody at this time. <coughs> would like to volunteer. Uh, you can do so next week. Uh, camp First uh, be the first. Uh, camp First will be a day camp. Middle school and high school students beginning Wednesday, June the 16th. It'll be 8 in the morning with Bible study. The day will follow with community service projects, learning, activities, and recreation, and conclude around 5. In fact, I think Dennis is going to teach them how to change the tire. I, I hope so too, I, I guarantee you. I, seems like I changed a lot of them on the side of the road. Uh, VBS 2021 Rainforest Explorer will be held Wednesday evening, starting June the 16th through July the 21st. Dinner at 5.30, 
Uh, and then the extra roaring begins at 6 and ends about 8. Uh, there is a form in your bulletin to fill out if your children are coming, nieces, nephews, neighbors, anybody who wants to come. Yes, yeah, just pick them up off the side of the road and bring them in. I got you. Okay. Uh, anything else? Well, they do still need volunteers, I think. So if anyone is interested in helping out, I guess let Vicky know or Jennifer or whoever. Okay. All right. Y'all hear that? Still need volunteers? Uh, the Sunday school camp out. Well, that shot by me quick. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, youth and anyone from the congregation like to attend uh, be camping at Lake Grayson in Arkansas. Uh, they have campsites already reserved at the dam. Uh, Dear SWAHA, I guess everybody knows. Which stands for. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, you arrive on Friday afternoon and be leaving Sunday afternoon. Swimming, boating, and social. Do you have any questions? Ask Pastor or Vicky uh, about that. And then uh, Randy Sams will be the 15th. Wayne, anything you need to well, say? That's correct, you. Anything you need to say? Well, I, I will say this. Uh, <laughs> after we took the food down the last time, they told us they would call us if we were able to serve. And as of that phone call, we will be able to start serving again. And I know uh, many of you are looking forward to that. So uh, so hopefully on the 15th we'll be able to serve. But I'll, I'll keep everyone in for in case it changes. Right, okay, thank you, Wayne. Does anybody have anything else? Yes, sir, Dan. Just to let you know, Karen and I will be going to San Marcos next on the delegate thing with pastor. If we get voted in. <laughs> uh, Speeches. <laughs> for being asked, we're forced to do something. So. But if all goes well, we'll be attending that. Okay. All right. Good. Anything else? I appreciate everybody showing up and listening to me today. I hope you have a great week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.